Hey everybody, it's Van Holtz once again. Another video. Uh, this time collected to reading, connected to reading lesson number 12. It's our first lesson um, with Percy Jackson, the Lightning Thief. It's exciting to get started with it uh, after all the, the build up that we've been doing with all the other texts to help us understand. Um, this lesson 12, and then there's another one afterwards, 12a, which we'll have tomorrow, um, are both connected to chapter 1. What I've done is I've uh, sent out electronic files uh, for each chapter and the whole book so that you guys can read along. We've also um, have the audio version playing so that um, read along with me. Um, but when we refer back to the text, it's going to be a little harder to do with these longer chapters. And so you can use the text version to just scroll through it quickly, quickly and, and mark the evidence that you're trying to find. And I'll show you how to do that when I do it today. Um, I'm really excited to dive in. It's going to be an interesting lesson. So let's do it. Whom, starting with the beginning, as always. Uh, so again, today we're it's reading uh, lesson 12, with, starting with the Lightning Thief, chapter 1. Uh, and we're going to draw inferences from the text by using our schema and information from the text. And we've made inferences before. Inferences is something that we've practiced a lot. Um, but what we're actually going to be focusing on today is something called the author's craft and author's purpose when we make our inferences. Uh, we'll talk more about what those things are, but it's important to think like an author because if we can get inside the author's head, we can sometimes see some hidden clues that they leave for us helping to understand the story and also for us enjoying the story more. The more we understand about what an author is doing, the more we can un um, enjoy the story, how, mu how much more we can understand how the story fits together. And uh, importantly too, as we become writers, we can use some of the same techniques that the authors use to make a good story in our own writing as well. So that's why we're doing what we're doing today. Um, as always, uh, I'm assuming that you have listened and or read the chapter when we dive into this lesson. So if you have not, make sure you go back and watch the video and read the text to make sure that you're prepared. Um, because today our exit ticket is going to be answering this question. Why did the author choose to begin the story in a museum? If you've read the chapter already, you know that it takes place in a museum. Uh, and the author chose to start there for a particular reason. So that's the... Uh, the inference we're going to try to make is to figure out why and make the best guess that we can and then use uh, details from and evidence from the text to help support our thinking. Um, and leading up to that, we'll take a lot of different inferences and practice inferencing on the way there with a little bit of help. So, uh, a couple vocabulary words to get us started. Uh, the first word is disgorge, which means to bring up from or as though from the, uh, the mouth or throat, uh, the better you can think of disgorge as throw up or barf or vomit, whatever uh, suits your, uh, that's what disgorge means, you're throwing something out. Uh, number two is uh, vitally, which means very importantly or necessarily. Um, it is vitally important that your heart beats, otherwise you will no longer live. And so that's what vitally is, it has to do with being very important. Okay. Uh, this third word is a word that um, Percy used to describe Nancy Bobafit, and she is a kleptomaniac, a person who has a psychological disorder that impels them to steal. So it's someone who can just not help uh, taking things. They steal stuff whether they want to or not, can't help it. It's a disorder. Uh, number four is stile, which is an upright stone slab or pillar bearing an inscription or design that is used as a monument, marker, or the like. Um, you can think of this as a gravestone if you've ever been to a graveyard um, to commemorate someone who's passed away. A stele is an ancient version of that uh, that was really only used for important people. Back thousands of years ago, uh, almost everyone was buried whether they had money or not, um, but most people um, who did not have money weren't marked their graves or they weren't marked with something fancy, um, so a stele was usually used to mark someone of importance. And then this last word is dyslexia, which is a learning disorder characterized by difficulty in recognizing and understanding written words. Um, it's a common uh, learning disorder that many people live with and grow up with. Um, it just means that when they are looking at words, sometimes the letters get switched around and they have difficulty recognizing and understand written words. Their brain is still very smart and they can understand language and they usually actually um, are really successful in a lot of arenas because of this difficulty. Uh, but it does make it hard to read written words. Cool. And so um, let's get our brains activated. Uh, today we're going to read about Percy, a student and one of his favorite teachers, Mr. Brunner. And uh, he likes some cool things about Mr. Brunner. 
and his favorite teacher, so I just want to know what do you like about your favorite teacher? And it doesn't have to be me, even though I know it is, uh, but you can pick some another teacher who you are going to lie and say it's your favorite uh, and what you like about them. So, pause the video, go ahead and do that. And now that you're back, uh, I'll share my uh, favorite teacher growing up. is my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Bissell. Um, and he just had, he behaviorally didn't let us do whatever we wanted. But academically, we could do basically anything that we wanted. He gave us a lot of freedom to choose the books that we wanted to read and study the things that we wanted to study with our friends. Um, and he seemed to know everything. And so uh, if even if... Uh, we were reading a book that he hadn't read before. He could somehow figure it out and still teach us on it. So it was, he was a really great teacher because he gave us a lot of freedom to explore the things that we wanted to explore. So uh, I'm interested to see what you guys say about your favorite teachers. Excellent. Uh, so before we get into our thinking questions that will give us a lot of practice leading into our exit ticket, um, we're going to do a quick uh, reminder lesson. This Actually, this one might be so quick, but I'll do it as fast as I can about inferences and then some new information about making inferences around an author's craft or an author's purpose. And so I'm going to go to the screen. So again, we're going to make inferences by using details from the text, as we know making inferences means using what the text says and what we already know to make a smart guess. Um, but there's going to be some specific ways that we make inferences today. So some of the words you're going to need to know, the first is author's craft. The author's craft are the choices an author makes to accomplish certain goals in a text. Okay. When you are writing, when you're making choices, you can decide what words to use, you can decide what characters to put in your stories, you can decide what information to give the reader. Um, and so all the choices that authors are making is their craft. Uh, and they make those choices to try to accomplish certain things in a book or a text. If they're trying to make a reader feel scared, they're going to write it one way, uh, rather than if they're trying to make them feel excited. If they're trying to prove one point over another point, um, they're going to write it in a different way. And so we're going to be focusing today a lot on the author's craft, what choices the authors makes. Connected to author's craft is the author's purpose. And this is the reason why authors make certain choices in a text. And so these two are always connected. Okay? The reason why authors do certain things is the reason why they're doing it. And the craft is more of how they do it. And so um, we're going to see a the author makes, in every book, makes a ton of choices about what they do and what they write and why they use certain words or why they um, describe a character in this way. And so that's what we're looking at in making guesses. We're trying to see if we can get inside the author's head, seeing if we can figure out why the author made certain choices and then diving into how the author uh, tried to accomplish those goals and those choices that they made. Um, and then taking a look at the author's purpose, there's uh, three of them. Uh, one is to persuade, which means trying to make s someone think a specific way about a topic. When you're trying to convince someone to do something, hey, this would be a good idea, let's go see this movie. No, I don't want to watch Moana, I want to watch a scary movie. I want to watch uh, something, and so if you're trying to convince someone to think a certain way, you're trying to persuade them. Okay. Inform means to teach. It's a simple, so that's we're going to see that in a second. And then entertain is to try to make someone enjoy themselves. Okay, so we're, we'll talk more about what these things are, but I want to make sure you know what the words meant before we go. Uh, a brief next, we're just going to get a brief refresher on inferences. Again, inferences are we're going to use uh, the, our schema in the text to make a smart guess about anything. And you get detail from the text. We put it together with our schema and we make a smart guess. As we keep reading, though, we have to reevaluate our guesses. Uh, we used this example before. A man came into the house. She was dripping wet from head to toe. We know that when it rains, people come in wet from outside, so the guess is it's raining outside. But then as we keep reading, we reevaluate. We make sure that our guess still makes sense as we get new information. Outside, the sun was shining through the window and hot air blew in through the door. So it's probably not raining. Our guess doesn't make sense anymore. we got to make a new guess. People can also get wet from showering, swimming, or exercising. Those are some other things we know that people can get wet from. Oh, Amanda was probably exercising because she came from outside and she didn't mention a pool. So this is just a brief refresher on making inferences. Use what the text says and what we already know and make a smart guess. And then as we keep going, we have to reevaluate that smart guess, make sure it's still a smart guess based on the new information that we got. Now, the new information, or somewhat new for some of us, uh, is we're going to be talking about inferences around the author's craft and this purpose. We're actually going to talk about this purpose first. Right? When we think about author's purpose, uh, there's three main um, reasons why authors write books and um, why they make the choices inside those books. And this doesn't look like a pie, it looks more like a peace sign. Um, but a way to remember it is by 
pi because there's three main authors purposes. One is persuade, the next is inform, and then entertain. Again, persuading, try, again, trying to make someone think a certain way, inform, teaching somebody about something, and then entertain, um, trying to make someone enjoy themselves. And then if you notice, I underlined the P, I, and the E because author's purpose spells pi. Those are the three main reasons why authors do anything they do in the book or why they're writing a book in general. Now, author's craft is how they're accomplishing whichever thing they're trying to accomplish, how they're trying to persuade someone, how they're trying to inform somebody, or what they're trying to inform somebody about, and how or what they're using to entertain people. And so we're, I'm actually just going to give you some examples of each one of these and some ways that authors might do because it's going to help us make smarter guesses about the things that we're looking at today. So um, starting with persuade, one way that authors can persuade people is by giving facts, figures, or numbers. If trying to convince someone that Steph Curry is a better player than LeBron, you might say that he has scored more points in a certain game. I don't know if any of this is true, I'm just making it up. Um, but giving those numbers or those facts can sometimes prove uh, the point that you're trying to make and change someone's mind. Okay. Another thing is called emotional appeal, which is when uh, you try to appeal to somebody's emotions uh, to get them to f change their mind. Um, this is seen a lot in political ads when people are trying to get uh, other people to vote for them or for someone that they support. Um, they might try to make someone feel afraid of a certain group of people so that um, they will vote for the people to keep them safe. We saw this in... Um, when did we see this? What article? Oh, never mind. That was a different class. Um, so anytime an author is trying to make you feel a certain way or to appeal to your emotions, either fear or excitement or anger um, to try to change your mind on something, saying, this person's really bad, you should not like them. Uh, they, they like to hit baby seals. Like that will make you um, try to change your mind. That's emotional appeal. And then last thing they can do is tell short stories or anecdotes to prove a point. Um, short stories or anecdotes are the same thing, but there might be something in an article where it gives, well, this uh, poor woman, her baby was taken from her, because uh, the, this man was evil. He wanted to uh, take the baby for himself. But that's really going to make you think that, man, that man is evil. He's taking babies. Oh, gosh. Um, so those short stories, those anecdotes might be used to persuade you to think a certain way about something. And so uh, these are some of the ways that authors can, um, some of the crafts or the tools the authors can use to persuade people. I'm going to talk about informing next. These are just actually kind of things that um Authors will might inform you about things. So, for example, a topic. This is mostly nonfiction. If the author is trying to teach you about a certain topic, that's what they're informing you about. In fiction, though, when they're informing you about things, they might inform you about the characters, what they're like, what they like, what um, their character traits, or their relationships with other characters. It might inform you about the setting, where or when the story is taking place. Uh, they might even just inform you by giving you background for understanding the story or the world, especially if this is a um, like we're going to be reading Greek mythology. If this is a fantasy world where not real things exist, they might they have to give you the information about why these things, the way the world works. Otherwise, it's not going to make sense to us. If it's a fantasy story where uh, everyone can summon ice from their hands and other people can summon fire from their hands, or you can carry a little ball in your pocket and throw it at an animal and it'll zap the animal and turn it into a little pet for you. Yes, I'm describing Pokemon. Um, that, that we need to understand that. The author needs to show that to us somehow. And so uh, the author can teach us that there's the story or the world or the background is important for us to understand how the story works. And this is uh, something that we'll actually discuss today, I think, is it might also inform, inform us about something that will happen in the future of the book. Okay, or at least give us a clue about something that might happen in the future of the book to set us up so that later when it, this thing happens were surprised because we didn't completely expect it, but we're like, oh, right, the author told us about this earlier on so that we're not like, wait, this thing this came out of nowhere. And so these are the kinds of things that an author can inform us about, uh, what either fiction or nonfiction stories. And then the last bit, entertaining, um, the, the can entertain us by just being funny. Um, the author can entertain us by building suspense 
or uh, by setting the mood. And what I mean by this is building suspense, uh, the best way to describe it is uh, when you're watching a scary movie and it gets really quiet, but then that one creeping uh, instrument sound that gets really built up and then bah, something big happens, that's suspense when you're like, oh my gosh, something's going to happen, something's going to happen. Um, and the same thing with the mood, it's just how the, um, the story feels. It can be an exciting mood, it can be a scary mood, it can be a funny that goof around mood. But anytime the author is trying to set the suspense or mood uh, is entertaining. Even if it's not funny, it's still uh, making us feel. And anytime we feel, we're usually entertained. Um, you can also entertain us by making connections to things that happened earlier in the book. Kind of like what I said with uh, something that will happen in the future. If it makes a connection like, oh, that's why the author did that. Anytime you go to, oh my gosh. Um, uh, like when um, Tolliver, not Tolliver, Ellen delivers the bread. Uh, she, pa when she delivers it, she makes a connection to early in the book that she was trying to, to pass it off. Or when she sees Dicey and she stands up for her, uh, stands up to her, it makes a connection back to the very beginning of the book when she goes being bullied by Dicey. That makes us really entertained. We're happy that she has grown. Uh, and so that can be an entertaining thing to do. And then this actually connects to persuade. Anytime an author is just appealing to our emotions, whether it's uh, to build suspense or to make us feel happy or to make us feel sad or scared or anything of those like that, that can be entertaining because that's why we, we read books, that's why we listen to stories. Um, we want to be, we want to have feelings. We want to connect with the characters and have the feelings that they're feeling. And so anytime the author is using emotional appeal, we can think of that as entertainment as well. Great. I know that was a lot. I don't expect you to memorize all these things, but we're definitely going to use this chart and these ideas when we're looking at our questions about the, um, the chapter today to help us understand the author's purpose, again, why the author um, made certain choices, and then the author's craft, how or what the author did to, um, get a, to accomplish that goal. Great. So, uh, let's take a look. Again, our big goal is going to be to explain why the author begins Percy's Story in a Museum. Um, and all of these things leading up to it aren't going to lead to this question, but they're going to give us some inferencing practice. Also, this would be actually ticket 12. Duh. Um, some practice making inferences about the author's craft and author's purpose, um, so that when we get here, when we can feel more comfortable making that same inference. So... Question one says, on page four, Percy says, in school suspension would have been nothing compared to the mess I was about to get myself into. Why does the author include this sentence? Uh, so go ahead and um, I'm actually going to pop over here to give you a little bit of a reminder, but you can pause the video, uh, head back into either the video with me reading it or the text that you have, find that line and make a smart guess about why you think the author included it. Go ahead and uh, pause the video, and now that you're back. So, uh, the question is asking why the author did something. So that's a author's purpose question. So let's take a look at the author's purpose. The author did it to either persuade us, inform us, or to entertain us. It's something about this. And so we kind of have to figure out which one of those it is, and then be a little bit more specific. And so the line, in school suspension, would have been nothing compared to the mess I was about to get myself into. Okay. Um, when we read the chapter, we know that happens on early. This is the, the book. Where did it go? Anyway. Well, I'm, I forgot. I can't find the line right now. That one. I apologize, I should have marked that, um, about where the in-school suspension would have been way better than the mess I was about to get myself into. But we do know that in this chapter, as we read it, uh, full on, all the way down uh, in the, the very end of the chapter, we found out that Mrs. Dodds actually attacks Percy and tries to kill him, and he has to defend himself and kill Mrs. Dodds. Now... Um, we didn't know that was going to happen, but when the author told us that way back, you know, it says it on page four. Oh, here it is. Ah! In school suspension would have been nothing compared to the mess I was about to get myself into. 
we don't know anything that's going to happen up here. But this tells us that something bad is about to happen, something worse than in-school suspension. And if you've ever had or know someone who's had in-school suspension, you know it's not fun, it's not great. And so the author, I think, is doing this to inform us that something is going to happen in the future. Something bad is going to happen in the future. And we find out that that's true. He has to fight one of his teachers who happens to be some kind of scary monster. And so, who, I think the author includes this sentence to inform us that something bad is going to happen to Percy later on. We don't know that he's going to be attacked by his teacher, who is a actual monster, who's a monster, but we can guess that something worse than in school suspension, which is bad, is going to happen. Cool. So again, the author put that line there to let us know that something bad was going to happen. It kind of builds suspense like, hey, something bad's about to happen. And then later we see that it does. The author makes us a promise and then fulfills it. Cool. Uh, now, second question. What inferences can you draw about Percy's behavior on field trips? And this is not an author's craft per se, but we can we can look at what the author does to give us information about Percy's behavior. Um, but we can go back and look what the author tells us about Percy's behavior and then make a smart guess about um, his behavior and features in general. So uh, go ahead and pause the video, head back into your text and make your smart guess. Then once you've done, check back in. Awesome. I uh, acknowledge you here, and I certainly have marked this one. So I'm going to, uh, again, when we make inferences, we use details from the text and make a smart guess. And so uh, what I've done is actually marked here uh, a couple things. Here, Percy tells us bad things happen to him on field trips. On his fifth grade field trip, he went to the Saratoga battlefield, had this accident with a Revolutionary War cannon. I wasn't aiming for the school bus, but of course I got expelled anyway, uh, which tells me that he shot a cannon at a school bus. Not good. And before that, at my fourth grade school, when we took a behind the scene tour of the Marine World shark pool, I sort of hit the wrong lever on the catwalk and our class took an unplanned swim, which means he dropped his class into the shark tank. Also, not good. And the time before that, and so the author is giving us over and over again repeated examples of Percy having bad or unsafe behavior on field trips based on this information right here. So uh, that's what we can make a smart guess about. We can say that um, it seems that Percy often has bad or unsafe behavior on field trips. For example, he shot a cannon at the school bus when he was in fifth grade. It doesn't ask for specific details in the text, so we can just paraphrase. The next one, though, uh, what inferences can you draw about Percy's education and what details support your inferences? Uh, we're going to make sure that we use exact details from the text and then make a smart guess about Percy's education based on what you read. So go ahead and pause the video. Go back into your text and try to find the details and make a smart guess from them. Awesome. And now that you're back, uh, let's take a look at some of those details. Again, there's a bunch of them, but the two that I found the most, uh, I think right here is a good example. The same text. Um, you have to make a little bit more of a guess from here is that he got expelled from when he was in fifth grade. He was a fourth grade school. It seems that um, and he's mentioning fifth grade school, fourth grade school. So he's been to a bunch of different schools. And if someone has been to a bunch of different schools every year, it's going to be hard for them to learn. So I'm imagining that his education is not very good because he's been to a bunch of different schools. Um, and then later on, he mentions uh, here 
that Mr. Brunner expected me to be as good as everybody else, despite the fact that I have dyslexia and attention deficit disorder, and I have never made above a C- in my life. Right? And so that, that shows us that he has never been successful in school. He has never had good education uh, because, uh, or at least in his eyes, he says his dyslexia and his attention deficit disorder have made it really hard for him to, f to focus, and he's never done well in school. And so those two details there tell us about Percy's education. So uh, I think uh, Percy hasn't had a very good education because he has had to move to many different schools and he says he's never done well in school. In the text, it says, and I'm going to use the uh, the second example I gave because I think it's a little easier to explain. Um, I have dyslexia and attention deficit disorder, and I never made. I have dyslexia and attention deficit disorder and I've never made, I think, I want to make sure I'm exact words, above a C minus life, a C minus in my life. Then anytime we have evidence we should explain, this tells me that Percy doesn't think he can be a good student because of his learning disabilities. And so we can we can infer that Percy does not have a great education. He's uh, had to be in many different schools, and he's never done well in school before. Cool. Um, let me actually check something really quick. All right, we've been going for a while. So um, I'm actually going to say that we can we can do number four very quickly, but I'm not going to type it out because uh, I want to make sure that. We keep our videos to a limit. It says, describe a theme the author might be trying to show through Percy's friendship with Grover. Use details from the text to explain your thinking. Um, we've done lessons on theme before. It's a, uh, a deeper lesson or truth about life that everyone can use all the time to improve their life. And you might be thinking, well, Mr. Von Holtz, we don't usually do theme until we've read a lot of the book because we can see what the characters have done. And that's true, we don't. But I think that proves a point here that mythology is full of themes and lessons that we can use and also that with this novel the author is going to be trying to prove those themes those lessons very early on um, and so go ahead and pause the video and answer this as best you can using details from the text great now that you're back I'm going to just share you with you my thinking I'm not going to write it down because I want to save some time uh, oops so we we'll look at his friendship with Grover. Um, pretty early on, explains right here with Grover um, that Grover is an easy target. He's scrawny. He cried when he got frustrated. He must have been held back several days because he was the only sixth grader with acne and the start of wispy beard on his chin. Um, so it tells us that uh, he's 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 someone who needs protecting, or at least is not very good at protecting himself. Um, and um, throughout here, Percy doesn't really stand up to him because he's trying to be on his best behavior, but he notices that he's getting bullied and tries to do the best that he can. Uh, he even says over here, I couldn't do anything to get back here because I was on probation. But do everything that he can to protect Grover. So this might be showing a theme that um, good friends look out for one another or that good friends risk themselves to help each other. Uh, because Grover is doesn't seem like he's able to protect himself, and so Percy is someone who's going to protect him from people like Nancy who can bully him. Um, so uh, that could be a, a theme that the author is eventually trying to prove about Grover's friendship with Percy. There's a bunch of other themes that you can um, probably detail, and I can't wait to see yours, uh, but to save time, that's, that's the one I'm going to point to. Great. And now, last, exit ticket. 
got a bunch of practice with making inferences. Um, some of them were authors craft related, some of them just using details from the text to make a smart guess, so let's put it all together. Infer, so make a smart guess, why the author begins Percy's store in a museum. You can take details from the text to explain your inference. All right, so I'm going to again put this up here so you can use it to help you out. It's asking why the author did something, so he's either persuading, informing, or entertaining us. And so then take a look through what is the author doing, why is the author doing it, how does the story of being a museum do any one of these things? All right, go ahead and pause the video, do your answer, make sure you use details from the text. All right, now that you're back, um, I'm going to actually look at the details from the text and see what they do first, and then I think we'll find the why. And so I've marked here in a couple places uh, that the details of being in the museum, what they give us. And so for here, um, this is some details from the museum. It says, he gathered us around, or sorry, it blew my mind that this stuff had survived for 2,000, 3,000 years. All right, so this, uh, we learned later that um, most of the stuff here was, oh, right here, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art to look at ancient Greek and Roman stuff. So we're looking at ancient Greek and Roman stuff. The stuff has been here for two, 3,000 years. Okay. They, and he told him to a 13-foot stall, stone column with a big thing on top and started telling us about the grave marker. For a st He told us about the carvings on the sides. And that Percy actually finds this pretty interesting. Okay. So this taking place in a museum allows us to learn a little bit about this Gre ancient Greek and Roman stuff. And then later on, we see it again down here when Mr. Brunner goes on to explain the entire origin story of the Greek gods. Zeus did indeed feed Cronus a mixture of mustard and wine, which made him disgorge his other five children, who, of course, being immortal gods, have been living and growing up completely undigested in the Titan's stomach. The gods defeated their father, sliced him to pieces with his own scythe, and scattered his remains in Tartarus, the darkest part of the underworld. On that happy note, so we can stop there, but we can see that because they're in this museum, the author is able to give us a lot of background information about Greek mythology that we will probably need to know to understand this story. If this didn't take place in a museum, the characters would probably have no reason to talk about Greek mythology because, let's face it, not a lot of people talk about Greek mythology unless they're in a museum or they're studying it in school. Uh, and so or they're watching it on TV somehow. Uh, and so the reason why the author put it there is to give us some background for understanding the story of the world that is taking place in. Um, so let's go here, and that's what we'll explain. I think, and again, this is writing, I think, because this is an inference. We don't know for sure. I think the author uh, begins Percy's story in a museum because it lets the author give us some background information about Greek mythology so that we can understand the story and the world better. For example, text says, and I'm actually going to use um, not this big slab, even though we could, I'm actually just going to use this small piece up here. Um, the uh, Heading to the Metropolitan Museum of Art to look at ancient Greek and Roman stuff. Heading to the Metropolitan Museum of Art to look at ancient Greek and oop, ancient should be here. Ancient Greek and Roman stuff. This shows that um, the characters will have a reason to talk about ancient Greece. I 
you know, I don't want to keep capitalizing that. Ancient Greece. So that we can learn about it and better understand what is going to happen in this in this story. Awesome. So let's check our criteria. Did we correctly explain what the text means? Yep, right here. Um, we explained what we why we thought. Do we draw an inference? We sure did. We made a guess about why the author did it here. Do we include detail from the text? Sure did. Details from the text here. And then we included our background information. Um, we knew that this story was going to be about Greek mythology. That's stuff we already knew. Um, and so we can make this smart guess that the author started at museum so the characters would have a reason to tell us more about it so that we could better understand the story. All right, so if your answer looked like this, then excellent job. Now, I know that was a ton. Author's purpose and author's craft are a lot of information. Um, we'll be talking a lot about it in the future for different topics and different reasons uh, and different things that the author do in the book. Uh, so hope you hope you found it um, understandable to start, and it's something that we'll continue to practice throughout the entirety of the book, and we'll get better and better at it. So the next lesson is labeled 12A, which means uh, it's connected to the same text. We're just reading chapter one. It's chapter one again, um, but we'll be thinking about it a little bit differently this time. So I'm looking forward to talking about that with you then. Goodbye, stay safe, and keep reading.